Hi everyone. Our topic this week is patient education. Every specialty in healthcare has a variety of patient education materials, such as brochures focusing on different disease processes and other health concerns. For example, an orthopedic department may have information on torn knee menisci, or rotator cuff impingement, total hip replacement surgery, and so on. You get the idea. Medical administrative professionals may be in charge of creating or keeping a supply of these patient education materials available for patients, and there are thousands of these types of topics. However, today we will focus on broader patient education topics. This presentation will focus on three main topics, patient's bill of rights, patient consent, and patient instructions. We're gonna take a closer look into each one of these. In 1998, President Bill Clinton received the final report that would become what is now known as the Patient's Bill of Rights. The report was entitled, Quality First, Better Healthcare for All Americans. There are three major goals to the Patient's Bill of Rights. The first goal is to help patients feel more confident in the U.S. healthcare system. The second goal reaffirms the importance of a strong relationship between patients and healthcare providers. And the third goal is to confirm patients' critical role in safeguarding their health and improving their health. So there are three main goals for the Patient's Bill of Rights. There are eight sections within this bill, and they are shown here. Uh, section one is information disclosure, and this just talks about the patient having the right to receive accurate and easily understood information about their health plan, healthcare professionals, and healthcare facilities. Um, and this part of the bill also gets into if a patient speaks another language or has some kind of a physical or mental disability and doesn't understand something, um, assistance needs to be provided so that the patient can understand and uh, that they can make an informed decision. The second section of the Patient's Bill of Rights is choice of providers and plans. So this is where uh, the bill says that we have a right to choose healthcare providers um, that is sufficient to provide access to appropriately high quality care. The third section of the bill talks about access to emergency services. So if the patient has severe pain or an injury or a sudden illness, um, they have the right to receive screening and stabilization emergency services whenever and wherever needed without prior authorization or financial penalty. So again, we're talking about emergency situations here. The fourth section then, participation in treatment decisions. Um, and this is just saying that the patient has the right to know all treatment options and to participate in the decisions of what will be happening to their care. Um, and if a patient is unable to make decisions, then that decision goes on to parents, guardians, family members, and so on. Uh, the next section is respect and non-discrimination. And it's exactly what it says. Patients have the right to consider respectful and non-discriminatory care from their healthcare providers. Uh, then we talk about confidentiality, confidentiality of health information. So this this is wrapped up in the HIPAA law, right? This is the HIPAA part of it here. Uh, patients have the right to talk in confidence with their healthcare providers um, and to you know, make sure that their medical record is um, being held in a confidential manner and also that patients have the right to see and get a copy of their medical record. And then consumer responsibilities uh, talks about just um, making sure that, that patients as consumers have responsibilities to um, keep their health care on their own and make sure that they're doing whatever they can to keep healthy and avoid uh, other types of issues coming up.
Most healthcare facilities have a summary of the patient's bill of rights that may be posted in a prominent place or a copy of the summary may be provided to patients upon admission to a facility. Um, if a patient has a language barrier or their ability to understand is limited, an interpreter may be needed to ensure the patient's rights are understood. All right, let's move on to our second topic today of patient education, different kinds of patient consent. The Google Dictionary defines consent as permission for something to happen or agreement to do something. So keep that in mind as we talk about patient consent. Relating to healthcare, there are three different types of consent. One is what we call implied consent. The second type is called express consent. And the third type is called informed consent. And let's look at these in a little bit further detail. When a patient schedules an appointment and comes to the appointment, implied consent has already taken place. Consider if a patient schedules a complete physical exam and comes to the appointment. The patient has already given implied consent just by showing up. In other words, we assume vital signs will be taken, an exam will take place, and information will be exchanged. This is implied consent. Express consent may be written or oral and is standard before any surgical or special procedures. Suppose while the patient is having their physical, physical exam, the physician notices impacted cerumen in the patient's ear and suggests the nurse flushes this out. If the patient says yes, this is expressed consent, and the nurse can go ahead and do this. If oral consent over the phone um, is given, it should include a three-way conversation involving the patient and two office personnel, both of which should sign a consent form as witnesses. For more formal procedures, consent should be written and sealed with the patient's signature along with a witness. Express consent, whether oral or written, is important to avoid lawsuits in the future. The gold standard for written consent, especially for surgical or special procedures, is known as informed consent. This just takes both implied consent and express consent to the next level. The patient is provided a document which fully explains the illness or problem as well as the planned procedure in layman's terms. The risks and projected benefits as well as prognosis following the procedure are also fully explained. Providers must be able to answer any questions the patient or guardian has. The goal of informed consent is for the patient to be able to make a knowledgeable, informed decision. The patient must sign the consent form. If the patient is a minor or is disabled, a parent, guardian, or next of kin is required to sign the form. Some exceptions to the legal age include the patient being in the military and away from home, a minor living away from home, such as a college student, a minor who is married, uh, pregnancy tests don't require, uh, don't require a parent's signature, uh, diagnosis and treatment of sexually transmitted disease, diagnosis and treatment of alcohol and drug abuse are also two other examples of when uh, the legal age um, and minority does not pertain. The informed consent documents should contain what's listed here. Of course, the name of the patient, the date, name of procedure to be performed, an explanation of the procedure, a statement of risks and benefits and alternatives to the procedure, a statement that patient signs to signify understanding of the information, the patient's signature, and a witness if necessary. Other examples of getting patient's consent would include if a physician wishes to videotape a patient's visit or procedure, or use a patient's photo in a study or a research paper, and so on. Consent forms may be signed electronically or on paper. Paper copies are scanned and saved into the patient's electronic health record and is considered a legal binding document. The last type of patient education we will focus on today revolves around giving patient instructions. As a medical administrative professional, you may be in charge of scheduling and coordinating tests and or procedures for patients. Some procedures and tasks have special instructions that patients need to learn. 
Each test or procedure may have unique instructions. Here are some examples for preoperative instructions for procedures requiring general anesthetic. Do not eat or drink anything after midnight. If taking medications, ask the nurse if you should continue them that day or perhaps discontinue them beforehand. Leave all valuables at home. Arrange for someone to drive you home and to stay with you for 24 hours. Bring insurance identification cards. Wear comfortable, loose-fitting clothing. When I was a medical administrative professional supporting surgeons at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics, I was in charge of scheduling patient surgeries and providing these types of instructions. Just as preoperative instructions may vary, so may postoperative and outpatient procedures and test instructions. A few typical postoperative directions um, might be listed, such as here. Uh, your surgeon will provide specific instructions for care. For the first 24 hours, do not engage in strenuous activities, drink alcohol, drive, or make critical decisions. A nurse will call you within one or two days to see how you are doing. An example of a test might be something such as an ultrasound, a pelvic ultrasound. For this radiologic study, the patient should be instructed to drink 32 ounces of water an hour before the appointment and come to the appointment with a full bladder. If your job requires you to provide patient instructions, keep a good reference set of instructions available at your fingertips to refer to. We've briefly covered the patient's Bill of Rights, different kinds of patient consent, and providing patients with instructions. Keep these things in mind as you begin your new career in healthcare. The type of job you secure after graduation will determine which of these patient education topics you may be involved in, as well as others. Thanks for joining me for this presentation, and have a great week, everyone.